the Super Speedway. And Jeff Gordon is about to write his name in the racing history books. Years from today when 79 stock car races have been run here, we'll remember the name. Jeff Gordon, winner of the inaugural Brickyard 400. The checkered flag is out. Goodyear makes a move. Little Al wins by just a few tenths of a second. Perhaps the closest finish in the history of the Indianapolis 500. Now let's see. They're down to four or five car lengths. And a slow car right around and Earnhardt. He's right on his back bumper. Let's see what strategy he pulls over. Labonte is sideways but wins the race. Crashes and he wins anyway. How about that? Here comes the field down for the white flag. One more to go. Run is inside him. Dale Earnhardt. And they go into turn number one and both of them spin. They come through the trioval. Checkered is waving. Ernie Evan wins and Rusty spins and gets airborne. And flips wildly right at the start finish line. Very reminiscent of his accident at Daytona. Who is it going to be in the Champions Park Club 400? Jarrett has the slight advantage as they go into the third and fourth corners. Davey Allison battles back on the outside. It's going to be a photo finish. They touch coming down through the trioval at the line. Who wins it? I believe Jarrett. Welcome to episode 205 of the Super Speedway Podcast, recorded Tuesday, August 10th, 2021. I'm your host, Eric Young, and I am joined this week not by James, who is uh, taking a break on vacation, but with Steve Lester from the infamous Baron Speedway. Uh, Steve, how's it going today? It's going pretty well. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, and I hope James is having a nice vacation. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you're a, a frequent listener of the podcast, you know we talk about Baron Speedway a lot. Um, but we'll chat with Steve here a little bit, just a bit of, a bit about the track. Steve was on the on the show back a couple years ago uh, when we were at Chicagoland Speedway, but I know the track's had a lot of updates since then, Steve. So I guess just start out, uh, you know, what is what is Baron Speedway to start out with? So uh, Baron Speedway was something I've always wanted to do since a kid um, and decided to do it once I moved up to Michigan, started a job and had an extra bedroom in the apartment to uh, put a racetrack in. So started designing it and wanted it to be big enough that it could hold 40 to 43 stock cars and look decent and also uh, keep in the same room size. So landed on 0.4 miles and then wanted to uh, make it the steepest banking possible without the car sliding off. So it's about 20 degrees banking and yeah, just to fit to the size of the room. Um, and it's kind of just taken off a little bit from there. With, it's always a uh, different little projects here and there to um, work on it, but I just really wanted to create a really cool diorama that, you know, looked like the real thing. Yeah. I would say, uh, you know, I, you finding you, you were the first one, actually James found you, um, and clued me in and, f but through you, I found so many other people who are doing the same sort of thing. Um, no offense to them because everybody that does this is, it's great. And I've always wanted to do this myself too. And just don't have the, didn't have the space. I have the space now but just didn't, haven't had the, the whatever it takes that last step to actually do it. Um, but I think mm -hmm. yours is the best looking one out there as far as, as the ones that I've seen. Um, it's the most complete. I like the fact that it's, it's not a, it's not a replica of a track, but there's, there's hints of other tracks in there, which is pretty neat. Um, yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been cheering right along as you've done the work on it. Um, what's, uh, what are you working on right now? Is there anything in particular, any project you're, you're working on right now with it? Or are you kind of comfortable with where it's at right now? Um, there's some things I want to do. I've had uh, caution lights in a bin for about a year now that I just haven't <laughs> done yet. Um, so I do want to put those up. Um, one of the things I'm working on now is uh, I did a throwback last year to 2000, the 2000 race. So I've got, I'm working on uh, a couple customs to finish a 2004 um, season. So I'm going to be working on that. Um, besides that, yeah, there's I like to do a crossover gate at some point, um, just different little things here or there. Uh, one of the big things that I really want to do is uh, put in a road course. Okay. So it would actually be a separate track than this one. Um, and I would use this one a little bit more for the outside diorama pictures or set it up somewhere else. So that's something I've been keeping in my mind as well. Awesome. And I know you've, you've gained traction online. Um, you've got a lot of people following what you're doing. 
who's uh, I guess maybe who is the most interesting or who is the who's the biggest person that's reached out to you with regard to this track? Um, I think one is uh, certainly Corey LaJoy. He started following early on and uh, talked with him a few times and uh, he actually sent me a sample prototype of the Scooby-Doo car that's to put on awesome. the track. So that was really cool. Um, yeah, there have been a lot of a lot of people. Um, Elijah, whosoever from uh, Chip Ganassi Racing, uh, he's reached out a couple other drivers and then also a NASCAR NBC as well for a couple things. That's very cool. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we'll take the credit. We found you first, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I will say, I mean, if anybody hasn't checked this out, we've, we've talked about it on the podcast many times. Uh, uh, Steve's been my shout out several times. Uh, Baron Speedway on Instagram, probably the easiest way to get a hold of you is Instagram. And I know you're on Twitter and, and stuff too, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. And I have a YouTube channel. I don't really check much, but I'll post something there every now and then too. But yeah, definitely Instagram is the, uh, the best way to go. It's just incredible the stuff that, that you've done with this track. It's it's so neat. Um, I mean, the photo. It's not just the work that you've done with the track. It's the photography with it as well. You've got shots on the Instagram page that look like you're sitting in the stands or, or look like you're watching the you know from the camera for the TV broadcast. And I'll tell you what, I wish it was a real track because I think it'd be a hell of a race. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty cool. That'd be place. really cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's uh, there's someone that's trying to create it to put it into NASCAR Racing 2003 that's awesome. as a mod, which would be insane. But yeah, that's really yeah, it's, cool. uh, I appreciate that a lot. That's the uh, probably the biggest compliment I can get is that you know people want to be at the track actually watching a race, and yeah, that's uh, definitely makes me smile whenever I hear that or people comment on that. It is it is really neat. So like I said, everybody check it out. Uh, Baron Speedway Instagram Twitter. Um, and YouTube, I know YouTube, you've got a couple of tutorials on how you've done different things, which is pretty neat as well. Um, and I'm sure if people wanted to reach out and figure out how to do what you're doing, um, you'd be more than happy to chat with them too, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. That's the main purpose of the page is to, um, show what I've done and also to help others in being able to learn different techniques. So yeah, definitely open to that for sure. That's awesome. What is, what's your wife think of it? She thinks it's really cool. Uh, definitely likes it a lot more. Um, now that we have the space down here in the basement since we moved to the house. Um, but yeah, she's, uh, all in favor of me doing it. So it's uh, pretty cool. Very cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's, let's talk some racing here, Steve. Uh, we had uh, Watkins Glen this weekend, went back from a two week break, uh, with the Olympic break. Um, of course, I, I guess I failed to mention coming into the show too. We had the tribute to, uh, Bob Jenkins, uh, at the beginning of the show, obviously, uh, uh very sad news, uh, this week that Bob Jenkins has passed away a long time. Uh, broadcaster with ESPN, uh, IndyCar broadcaster, NASCAR broadcaster, anybody who watched uh, NASCAR in the in the mid '90s, um, early mid '90s, definitely knows the voice of Bob Jenkins. So I've uh, been battling brain cancer for a while, and uh, and very sad news of the day that we uh, we didn't want to come. So uh, thoughts and prayers are with the family of Bob Jenkins, um, and he will be remembered as one of, if not the greatest, uh, NASCAR broadcaster, in my opinion. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really sad to see him go. I've been, it's every time I hear, I mean, I, it gives me chills listening to that, that intro, some of those calls. And just for the record, the last call there, which was Michigan and Davey Allison and uh, Dale Jarrett battling the line for the photo finish. I was there, which was awesome. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, just gives me chills. That, that was my childhood is listening to him, uh, broadcast races. He was he's the reason that I wanted to be a NASCAR broadcaster for years or, or, or a, an announcer in general. Um, he was kind of my idol. So, uh, again, very sad news with, uh, with his passing this week. So, uh, right. Watkins Glen this weekend, we had the goal bowling at the Glen, uh, for the NASCAR cup series. All three series were in action this weekend and Kyle Larson once again, gets it done on the road course. Uh, gets the win over Chase Elliott, who I think was coming. I mean, he was he was there. Uh, if he wouldn't have had, um, if he wouldn't have flat spotted the tires and had to take the early pit stop, I think uh, I, I think that Chase might have had a little bit more for Larson there at the end. Um, but uh, but Larson's able to hold him off, and uh, you know maybe lap traffic played a little bit of a role at the end if uh, if um, Chase would have gotten a break or something. Might have had a chance to do it, but uh, but yeah, what do you think of uh, what do you think of Larson's performance so far this year, Steve? It's just been incredible. He's uh, you know, showing what it's like to be in good equipment and to uh, combine his talent that he has to go run that and then go win on a dirt track 
a few days later right. to just go back and forth. It's two completely different skill sets that he's able to master. And um, yeah, it's fun to watch for sure. Um, I was rooting for Chase to come back up through the field. So that was cool that he was able to get back up to second. But yeah, it's um, awesome to see Larson get another win on the road course. Yeah, Chase was my pick. So I was hoping he'd get there. Actually, Larson screwed me up. He screwed up my fantasy because I didn't have, I, well, I'm out of picks for him. So I, I didn't have, uh, I didn't have him in my lineup. And then he, uh, he spun Christopher Bell too, which hurt me as well. Cause I had Christopher Bell and he was right up front. Um, I was doing pretty well for a while there. I know Todd was right up there pretty high. I think you beat me this week too. Um, but uh, yeah, Larson screwed me over, which doesn't surprise me. Um, <laughs> then uh, Brad Kozlowski has struggles throughout the day with his break issues. Um couple spins for Kozlowski, not very characteristic of him, uh, especially at Watkins Glen, a track that he normally runs pretty decent at. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, stuff to jump out at me in this race. I didn't, I didn't think it was a bad race. It was a good race. Um, I think, you know, Watkins Glen has proven that it's a solid race generally when we go there. Am I missing anything in this thing? It just seems kind of uneventful to me. Don't you know what you think? Yeah. I, uh, one, I just absolutely love the track. I think yeah. it's – it's got to stay on the on the on the circuit for years and years to come because it's just such a cool place to go to and yeah you just really get the speed and a little bit of the technical stuff as well um i ended up actually missing most of the race because i wasn't able to get service on my phone driving back from ohio um even listening to the radio couldn't quite get it all but got most of it so i did uh you mentioned the brad kozlowski a uh, couple spins through the brakes um taking out his uh, teammate Logano. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was kind of surprised also with uh, Penske starting one, two, three, that they fell off really quick as well. Cause I had Kozlowski in my lineup and then quickly put him on the bench. Yeah. I had, uh, I had the Benedetto in there because he ran so well at, uh, at road America. Um, but yeah, I don't know those. They're just, I mean, Brad wants to say that everything's good there with him leaving still, but I don't know. They're, I mean, they're out to lunch right now. Um, just not seeing what we normally see out of them. So I have a question for you. You said, I mean, we both agree Watkins Glen's a pretty good track. Um, I was reading an article from Bob Pockers this morning and brought up the question again as we bring up every year we come to Watkins Glen, whether we should run the boot or not. And I guess what before we get into it, let's. Uh, what, do, what are your thoughts on it? Would you like to see him run the boot or you like what we got right now? I kind of like what we have. And the main reason is because we have the addition of Road America that gets us that long road course and it's also in a beautiful beautiful circuit as well but i feel like for nascar it's just you know classic just to have the the race format that it is um you get this speed coming out of the carousel down to the left hander there and um i feel like you kind of miss that a little bit if you're jumping off into the boot at the end of that carousel i've been a pretty long proponent of wanting to run the boot um and i'd love to see it done but i don't know i mean it's it's tough because and then Bob notes this in his, in his article that Watkins Glen is a solid track. It's a good track. It's good racing. Um, I think the thing that makes Watkins Glen unique is it's more of a NASCAR style of a road course. It's not, it's a high speed road course. You know, you're not having those slow mm -hmm. tight turns that you see a lot of places. It reminds me quite a bit, honestly, of the old Riverside track, although that was, you know, had its differences too, but that was a stock car road course track. Um, and so I'd be really scared to add this to it and ruin what we've got because we've got a really good thing at Watkins Glen. Um, and, and, you know, you, you spread the race out. Now you've got, you know, it, it's a longer track. We learned it, like you said, at Road America, longer tracks, not necessarily the greatest thing. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I guess for once I'm kind of on board with just keeping it the way it is. Um, you know, we, we added the, the extra section back, the carousel back at Sears point or Sonoma, whatever it's called this, this year. <laughs> um, and, uh, it, it really hasn't changed the racing. It really hasn't added much to it. I mean, we've got one little, one more braking zone, but I think, you know, it took out kind of a compelling part of the track as well. So mm -hmm. I guess that kind of shows to me that it's just not necessary to, why fix it if it's not broken, I guess. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. And I think the braking zone too, you have a really good one heading into that left turn out of the carousel that. And depending on the speed you get on the exit of the turn really matters a lot. And then, yeah, I think I agree with you with Infineon or yeah, whatever it's called now, but 
um, that, that downhill coming off that downhill, going down to that right turn was always a classic battle spot or a classic spot to uh, gain position. So um, I'm also not quite a fan of that carousel, although I originally was when they put it in, but I didn't, you know, I'm not really a fan of them going down there, running up the drag strip to make the uh, right hand at the end. Yeah. I kind of feel like we should just go back to, and, and James is going to laugh when he hears this, but I kind of feel like we should just go back to the old Sonoma layout as well. Um, all right. So Kyle Larson gets the win. It is his 11th victory, 247 uh, cup series starts um, fifth victory and 16th top 10 finish in 2021. So a heck of a season for Kyle Larson. Um, I think we all expected to see him do well. Uh, maybe not to the level that we're doing. He's doing right now. I uh, kind of fell off a little bit for a couple of weeks, but uh, obviously back again and going to another road course this weekend. Uh, you kind of can expect that uh, Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott probably are going to be pretty strong up there as well. Um, Chase Elliott finishes second. It is his third top 10 finish on six races at Watkins Glen. Um, 13th top 10 finish in 2021. Martin Truex Jr. comes home in third. Uh, Chase Briscoe gets ninth as the highest finishing rookie on the day. And Kyle Larson now leads the point standings by a total of zero points over Denny Hamlin <laughs> as we head into Indianapolis. Um, just looking at the results here, as far as anybody else that really jumps out at me, um, uh, I mentioned Christopher Bell, another strong performance on a road course with, for him, um, struggled you know, with the, with the contact with Larson that pushed him back a little bit, but still comes home with a sixth place finish. Uh, Tyler Reddick was impressive throughout the day, ends up coming home 10th, uh, Ross Chastain. I was hoping for bigger things out of him. He was in my lineup, uh, finishes 12th, but still, uh, runs decent throughout the day as well. Um, Ryan Blaney, you know, good road course guy, just not great at uh, Watkins Glen, finishes 14th. Um, guys in the back, kind of pretty much who you expect, other than Brad Keselowski hanging back there in 35th uh, with a bad day. So um, anything else that we want to talk about with Watkins Glen for the cup race before we hit the smaller series there, Steve? Uh, yeah, nothing I can think of. I think we're good to talk about the next ones. All right, uh, Xfinity Series and Truck Series had a doubleheader on Saturday. We'll start with the second race of the day. It's the Xfinity Screwball Peanut Butter Whiskey 200. Gotta love these race names. <laughs> um, Ty Gibbs, once again, gets it done. Outduels two of the best road course racers in the Xfinity Series, and AJ Allmendinger and Austin Sindrick. Uh, leads 43 of 82 laps uh, to get the win. Um this is a kid that, you know, before this season, we hadn't really heard much from him. Uh, had some, you know, some impressive runs in Arca, but Arca is Arca. And uh, mm -hmm. now he comes into the Xfinity series without going through the truck series and is lighting the world on fire. Uh, I got to think it's, it'd be hard to believe that he doesn't have a full-time Xfinity ride next year. Right. Yeah. I would hope they put him in the Xfinity car for sure. I think he's certainly earned it. It's uh, amazing to watch him. Uh, battle on those road courses, especially with having Cindric and Almendinger and the battles that they've had this year as well. So yeah, really fun to watch him. And um, I kind of imagine he'll have some sort of growing pains if he goes full time, but you would think, he really but... hasn't. <laughs> yeah. He, but he hasn't really shown any so far. <laughs> he hasn't shown a single weakness. He's had a couple equipment failures, but other than that, he's always right there. He's not intimidated by any of these guys. I mean, his very first mm -hmm. race he went out there and dueled these, these guys at Daytona and just impressed the crap out of everybody. Um, he's aggressive. You know, some guys don't like him very much, but hey, it doesn't matter when you're sitting in victory lane. Right, right. Yep. Yeah, he's not afraid to put the nose to the back of another person's car at all. You see that in the Arca a lot, but yeah, it's yeah, good for him. Yeah, good to see him get the win again. Yeah, that's the style of race that we see in the Xfinity Series now anyway. So if you're not doing that, you're not doing something right. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been impressive. I think this is, you know, this is one of those reasons you see somebody like, uh, Harrison Burton, uh, leaving the JGR pipeline because, or the Toyota pipeline, even because you got this kid coming up that he's, he's going to get himself some seats if he keeps running the way he is. For sure. And yeah, with uh, the cup series rides, the driver's getting older there and who knows what Denny's going to do. There's definitely opportunity there for him. For sure. Plus having their last name Gibbs as well doesn't hurt either. <laughs> that helps a little bit when the uh, when you have the same last name as the team owner, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mentioned AJ Allmendinger, Austin Sindrick. They finish second and third in this one. Uh, Justin Allgaier does well as well. Uh, finishes fourth. Uh, Harrison Burton rounds out the top five. Noah Gregson, uh, solid finish in seventh uh, for 
the Xfinity series. Um, somebody who struggled a bit this season. Uh, Eric Jones had a pretty good wreck, um, break issue heading into one of the turns and, uh, put it into the wall, but, uh, uh, comes home with a 36th place finish and a rare, um, Xfinity series start for him. Austin Dillon also ran this one, finished 37th, uh, with a chassis problem. <clears throat> um, Again, not a super eventful race, but not a bad race. Uh, this is Ty Gibbs' third victory in 11 Xfinity Series races. Um, and his third victory in eighth top 10 finish in 2021. Pretty good for a guy who's running part-time. Uh, let's see your... Oh, where the heck am I at? I lost. Uh, Ty, Ty Gibbs was the highest finishing rookie as well in first. Um, and Austin Sendrick leads the point standings in the Xfinity Series with 80 points over A.J. Allmendinger. Uh, started the day with the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series, and again, a not a super eventful race. I don't know that I have a whole lot to talk about with this one, but Austin Hill leads 35 of 61 laps to take home the win, beats John Hunter Nemechek, uh, Sheldon Creed, Todd Gilliland, and Parker Kligerman were your top five uh, for this one. Um, first time we've seen the uh, Truck Series on the on Watkins Glen, on the Watkins Glen, Watkins Glen course in quite a while. Um, put on a decent show. Uh, again, not too eventful though. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the most eventful part was John Hunter Nemechek turning right when he was in the very left lane, heading into turn one, and then, um, yeah. Besides that, not not too much going on. But good to see Kligerman get up there in fifth. A lot of struggle on restarts in turn one for this one. It, it looked like it was going to be a theme all day, but it just ended up being this race uh, in, in particular. Um, yeah, Parker Kligerman, I love seeing him run well. Um, great to see a top five finish for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Austin Hill has his eighth victory in 113 Camping World Truck Series uh, races with this one. Um, it's his second victory of 2021. And uh, Carson Hosevar, top finishing rookie. Got to see Carson Hosevar over the week, uh, past, or over the off week. Uh, raced in the uh, CRA JEG series at Birch Run Speedway. Got to go out and check that out and got to meet him. That was pretty cool. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Nice guy. Yeah, nice. Michigan guy. Yep. Nice guy. Uh, finished second in that one. He uh, he he finished second to um, uh, Cody Coughlin. So. Okay. Nice. Uh, let's see. With that, um, we also had the IndyCar series. I, I know you said you were on the road. Did you get a chance to catch any of the uh, Big Machine Music Gr uh, City Grand Prix at uh, Nashville? Yeah, I got home, turned on Twitter, and saw the race was still going on. <laughs> and uh, tur turned on the race just in time to see Colton Herta go through the field all the way up to second until he uh, put it in the wall. But that was, yeah, that, that was all I caught from that one. It was the uh, highlights. <laughs> it was an impressive run. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a bit of a cluster. Um, had a lot of trouble getting the thing going. Um, not a whole lot of green flag laps in this one. I, I think the pace car might have led the field more than anybody else. <laughs> um, but very cool to see the excitement in Nashville. I think it just goes to show the the you know the the fan support that there is in that town. Um, NASCAR, of course, announced uh, during the off week as well that the uh, the banquet will be back there again this year um, to round out the season. Um, we're still working on trying to get that uh, the Nashville Fairgrounds race. Obviously the Nashville Super Speedway race was a big success uh, for the Cup Series as well, um, and this one they uh, I think they believe they sold out all the seats for this as well for the IndyCar, um, which is awesome. So uh, pretty neat. I, maybe another reason why we don't necessarily need a street course for the Cup Series, but uh... <laughs> yeah, that looked pretty tight. Yeah, if they uh, if they wanted it to be a Monaco in the United States, then uh, that's they're going to get single file Cup Series cars totally through that thing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, one thing I know was interesting to me is the way the pit stops worked. It, you know, in NASCAR, you come on pit road, you automatically come out behind the rest of the field. And when Colton Herta pitted, he went from first to sixth because of where he merged back into the field. You Wherever you merge coming off of pit road is where you get to line back up. So if you can make a pit stop and pass people on pit road, then, hey, you move up your spot. So I don't know. That was a little screwy. Yeah. Sometimes the... I love I love the the purity of the IndyCar series, but some of the things that they do are just make me shake my head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, to see that picture of him coming out of pit road and where, where it was with the other people, I'd be pretty frustrated if I was a crew chief for those other teams. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Especially when the pace car is slowing down to avoid a wreck. But 
Uh, pretty impressive to see uh, Marcus Erickson go airborne and uh, still manage to win the race, which is pretty pretty <laughs> incredible. I don't think I've ever seen that happen before. Maybe not even NASCAR. No. <laughs> so, uh, all right, good weekend of racing though. Uh, nice to have action back on the track. Did you uh, did you take any time to partake in the Olympics? Did you watch the Olympics, Steve, or did you take a break? Uh, watch watch some. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really watch too much, but I uh, did watch some on the weekends. Yep. I pretty much avoided them. I, I just could not get into them this year. Uh, how about uh, for the off week? Did you get a chance to go, or the, the two off weeks, did you get a chance to go to any tracks, check out any racing or anything? Um, I went to Berlin Raceway, but I feel like that was still during the on week, so I um, didn't really go check out anything else the past couple. Yeah, you went out there for the Arca race, didn't you? Yeah. Awesome. Yep. I haven't been out there in a while. I need to get back to Berlin. It's a great track. Uh, yeah, it's really cool with uh, – Jeff Striegel is doing a lot of good stuff there. Um, so he's taken over as the general manager, I believe. And yeah, they've, the stands are crowded when I was there. That's cool. Yeah, nice to see a lot of people there. It's a really cool place. If, if you're ever in the, the Grand Rapids area, definitely go out to Berlin Raceway. The, the Arca Series puts on a good show out there. They've got all kinds of great weekly shows as well. I've seen the ASA cars out there too. Um, back when ASA was still a thing. Uh, great track. Really, really, really unique. So. Uh, let's talk some news. Not a whole lot in the news uh, this week. Everything was mostly quiet during the uh, during the break. A lot of drivers and teams on vacation. Really irritating uh, not being on vacation, watching everybody on Twitter. Um, but uh, the we got some word this uh, during the break um, from Adam Stern that it looks like we're going to move the numbers forward on the cars uh, next year instead of backward. Um, so they'll be up towards the towards the front fender a little bit and give a little bit more room on the rear end uh, for the sponsorship. What do you? What's your thought on the number placement, Steve? Are you a are you a purist? You want them to stay where they are? You you happy with this move or what? What do you think? Um, I think I'm overall I'm pretty happy with it. I kind of gonna believe it when I see it. So probably <laughs> change a few more times before we uh, officially get them on the cars next year. But yeah, I, I think moving them forward makes the most sense, especially depending on the sponsor and the availability of. How they, however, they can use the back half of the side and that quarter panel, um, especially without the contingencies there anymore. It's it makes the most sense to put them there. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of think that this is the best option. Leaving the numbers where they were, I prefer because I'm used to it. But I think this mm-hmm. is going to be the least jarring change. I mean, it it certainly has looked kind of awkward without the contingency decals on the front of the cars. Although I've gotten used to that now, when I see a picture of one of the old cars with all the decals on it, it's like, whoa, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, so, but I, I think again, this is going to be the least offensive. People are going to, are going to be able to buy into this a lot easier. Um, and it still gives, it gives that extra sponsorship space for the, for the sponsors. Um, and, and you know, the biggest thing with this is that the, the rear quarter panel is shorter on the new car. So there's less room for that sponsorship decal to be, uh, the sponsors want a little bit more room to, to promote their brand. And if we can do that and make the cars not look stupid, I'm all for it. So, um, I like this. I like it. I think it's a good move. If we can't leave them where they are, let's move them forward. Um, first real glimpse of this I got was a couple of weeks ago. I stumbled across the hashtag move them forward uh, Twitter trend and uh, started seeing some of the, the paint schemes that guys like Lefty Designs had done um, with the numbers up towards the front. And it, it grew on me pretty quick. If, if this is done right by the teams, um, I think it'll look pretty good. Uh, Ross Chastain was announced the driver of the number one car for track house in 2022. Um, kind of a surprise here. I thought, I don't know what your, what your thoughts are on this, Steve, but, um, it really seemed like they weren't going to go with Chastain. Uh, obviously weren't able to get Kurt Busch on board with them. I think that kind of maybe guarantees that Kurt Busch or all but guarantees that Kurt Busch is going to go to 2311, which I think is what we all expect. Um, but did this surprise you at all to see, uh, to see Chastain sign on with this team? It kind of did. I was kind of expecting Kurt Busch to go, especially for having his veteran presence on the team that's pretty new. Uh, but then I see today, I believe it was David Smith had something about how um, his driver value rating has just gone up based on his performance this year. And if you know if those are metrics that the teams are looking at, then it kind of makes sense that he did go over here. But I do think it's also a little bit of a risk for such a new team. I thought it was really interesting because they kind of, when they had their press conference, when they announced that they'd bought the team, it kind of, they were kind of leaning towards that. We want a veteran driver in here to come in and help Daniel learn uh, where he needs to be. And Ross is not a veteran driver by any means. He's somebody that's got, got to learn some stuff himself. But like you said, he's improved immensely this year. 
Um, I mean, it's it's great for Ross. If you want a guy that's going to claw for everything, this is the guy. And it's nice to see something finally go right for Ross Chastain because um, he's been, you know, screwed out of rides a couple times in his career uh, by no doing of his own. So it's good to see him get the opportunity, but certainly feels like not in line with what uh, what Trackhouse originally was saying they wanted. So I'm having a feeling it was uh, it was a backup plan. <laughs> yeah, you kind of get that kind of get that feeling too that especially with the, how long it took them for them to announce it that definitely something had to fall between Kurt Busch or Chastain and likely it was Kurt Busch's decision probably that determined that one. Uh, good for uh, Ross Chastain though. He doesn't have to clean out his locker at the shop. He can just leave his stuff there and maybe move it over to the one locker <laughs> when the season's over. True. <laughs> uh, NASCAR is continuing to work on the Nashville Fairgrounds race. Uh, Marcus Smith says the the earliest a race could be run there is 2023. Um, I kind of think we all saw the writing on the wall that we weren't going to be there next year for sure. Um, but still working on it. Still continuing conversations. Uh, Marcus says things are positive. Um, I don't know. I hope it happens. I'd love to see the cars there. It'd be interesting to see what happens with the big track if we uh, we start running the small one. But uh, again, I think this past weekend shows that um, there's a lot of support in Nashville for racing. Uh, you know, all except for a couple of those neighbors around this Nashville track that are pushing for it yeah. not to happen. But uh, but it'd be, it'd be very cool to see uh, it'd be some great racing on that little track for sure. Yeah, I think so too. Um, yeah, those neighbors certainly have a lot of power if they're able to keep on pushing this thing away. But it's, it seems like each time it's getting closer and closer to happening, and I really hope it does too. But I, um, I guess I'm not going to get excited about it till we get a little further down the road there. But it's definitely an inclination whenever you sell out races at Nashville for a different series that you know racing belongs there. And if they can have closer to downtown with the fairground speedway, then that's going to uh, be pretty good for that market. Not only that, but we they sold out the stands there for the SRX race, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, again, just showing the support. They had the SRX series and the CRA JEG series there that night. Um, but SRX definitely filled the stands. So um, if, if they can fill the stands for an SRX race, you could probably put quite a few more in there and fill it for a Cup Series race without any trouble. So um, a lot of work going to go into that place to make it happen. Uh, but if you're going to have somebody put the work in, uh, Marcus Smith and SMI are probably the guys to have do it. So. Um, good luck to them. Hopefully they get it, ha- make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Hopefully 2023 is the year that it happens and yeah, it'll be a fun event to watch for sure. It'll be on my list to go to for sure. All uh, right. Let's, uh, I think that's all the news unless something popped up at the last minute while we were on here, but I think we're good. Um, we get to talk, uh, Indy this weekend, Indianapolis motor speedway, but we are not going there on the oval this week. We are going to the road course. It is the Verizon 200 at the brickyard. On the road course, we started off with the Pennzoil 150 at the Brickyard on Saturday with the NASCAR Xfinity Series. That is a doubleheader with the IndyCar Series as well on Saturday, which is cool. Um, get to do it again this year as we did last year, but this time with fans. So um, pretty neat deal to see the two series come together. I think the, the Roger Penske relationship uh, with NASCAR, obviously, and him taking over the ownership of the IndyCar Series um, can only mean good things for these guys. It's nice to see. It was neat to see all the cross-promotion on NBC this past weekend. Uh, between the two races and uh, I think there's some big things I think both these series can really help themselves grow um, by you know combining the fan bases instead of splitting them up as we've done so so many times in the past um, we'll make our picks here uh, James isn't here but he did make did send me his picks uh, so we've got his picks for this weekend we start with the Pennzoil 150 at the Brickyard uh, NASCAR Xfinity Series and I'm going to go with the low-hanging fruit on this one and pick Austin Sindrick as my pick to win this thing um, basically I need to earn some points on James because he, uh, finished ahead of me again this week, just by a little bit, every race, uh, the, the cup race really screwed me over though, with, is I had Chase Elliott and Chase got no points until the end, uh, with the second place finish. So, uh, James topped me 152 to 123 this week and, uh, leads to uh, 2203 to 2168. So I'm trying to catch him and going with Austin Sindrick this week to do that. But James is going to counter attack with A.J. Allmendinger as his pick for the Xfinity Series. Um, another good pick. Both those guys battled it out last year for the win. Obviously, Chase Briscoe was able to sneak away with it. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, Steve, who do you got this weekend? Who do you think is uh, is a good one to look for in, in the Xfinity Series? I feel like you guys left the uh, lowest thing <laughs> fruit one in there out on the table, so I'm going to go ahead and pick Ty Gibbs. There we'll see go. if they can uh, have a nice battle again uh, like they did this past week. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. That's a good pick for sure. 
Um, uh, be an interesting track. I, I can't wait to see the cup series on, on the road course. I'm still bummed that we're not running the, uh, running the oval, despite the fact that the oval hasn't been that good. Uh, still feels like traditionally we should be doing it, but, uh, we hit the road course for the first time in the cup series on Sunday, the Verizon 200 and I am again, going with the easy option and going with Kyle Larson. I had a tough time with this because I wanted to save him for Michigan. Now I can't pick him for Michigan and I leave him for James at MIS, but I feel like there's other options at Michigan and I can't pick chase. So I got to go with Kyle for the road course. And because I did that, James counters with chase Elliott for the road course at Indy. Um, and we'll probably finish one, two again. Uh, Steve, who do you think on this one? Who, who do you like at Indy? The first time we've ever seen a cup series here. Yeah. Um, kind of want to go with Christopher bell. That's a good, pick. Um, not exactly sure why, but I, <laughs> I'm not sure if he's had experience there in the past, but you know, him or he or Ch- Chase Briscoe would be some good picks, but I feel like Christopher Bell's been more consistent on those road courses. Yeah. Chase, if Chase was running better, I would, he would certainly be a, a dark horse pick for this one. Certainly somebody that could get you some points. He will be on my fantasy team this weekend for sure. Um, mm-hmm. Is obviously he ran, he, he ran really well there last year. Um, so there we go. There's our picks for Indy this weekend. Uh, let's talk fantasy league real quick. Um, Watkins Glen last weekend, green eggs and Hamlin comes out on top with 226 points. Uh, Steve, you got second Baron Speedway, second place, 221. Nice job there. And Thank uh, you. I managed to beat James. I don't know. I thought James was ahead of me, but I guess not. Uh, and then, uh, Todd was ahead of me for a while too. freight train, but he slips back to sixth. Uh, I got fourth hot rod. Todd was third tandem draft. Tona was fifth. Uh, we look at the overall standings and Ranger Runyon still holds on to the lead 45, 76, uh, James is second Smokey come back at 43, 45. Uh, I am still hanging in on third 42, 80. Um, those are our top three. Uh, Steve, you're back in seventh trying to gain on, uh, trying to get on Todd. You got to pass Todd. Yeah. Try to got to get in that top five. I've been hanging around the middle too much. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm concerned over the next couple of weeks as I've really round down wound down my picks, but the biggest one that I'm missing now is Larson. So um, I managed to save a Kyle Bush pick after um, New Hampshire, so that luck lucked out a little bit. Um, I still have mm-hmm. two picks I think for him left, but uh, but yeah. Um, all right, uh, this is the point of the show where we do our shout outs. I don't think I have any this week. I feel like I should. But I can't think of anybody. Anybody you want to shout out, Steve, this week? Yeah, this is the one part I didn't prepare for. I don't really <laughs> think I have any others either. There is the uh, there is the new podcast by Dirty Mo Media with uh, Rick Houston telling some racing stories on there. Um, I do forget the exact name of it, but it's a really long name. So that one, I enjoyed listening to today's episode with Lyndon Amick on there, driver I haven't heard of in a while. And so it's good to hear the interview with him. So I could use that one as my shout out. That's cool. That's cool. I haven't checked it out yet. I saw the, I saw it pop up in the feed, but I haven't, uh, I haven't listened. So I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, I guess I don't, I got nothing. So, um, with that, we will close things out here and head into Indianapolis this weekend. Uh, Steve, we already mentioned it, but where can we find you on social media? If people want to check out what you're doing. I'm uh, under Baron Speedway on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Awesome. You can find James if you want to give him a hard time on his vacation. He'll be back next week at James Cush on Twitter. You can find me at T Super Speedway on Twitter. You can find the fo- podcast on Facebook, facebook.com slash the Super Speedway. Our website is the Super Speedway.com. You can find old episodes of the podcast there. Uh, show notes, links to articles we discussed, all that stuff. We'll have race coverage there as well. And speaking of which, I have not announced on the show yet, but James and I will be at Michigan International Speedway in a couple weeks to, uh, to, with access to cover that. Um, so look for driver audio, all kinds of fun stuff, probably a podcast from the track, uh, all kinds of neat stuff there. So check that out in a couple of weeks. Uh, you can find the podcast in Apple podcast, Spotify, Spotify, Google play, Stitcher and SoundCloud, wherever you found us today. We hope you subscribe and continue to listen. Uh, if you got some time during the week, and you want to check out a pretty awesome track, check out Baron speedway on Instagram. Um, we really thank Steve for stopping by today and joining us, uh, filling in for James while he plays hooky camping up North, just I I gave him a hard time because I know there's internet up there. He's been texting me. So I know he could do this show, but he's, he's slacking. See how he is. Uh (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, James will be back next week. We will break down the Indianapolis weekend. I don't know if he gets a chance to watch the race. They probably don't have TV up where he's at either. So um, we'll be back next week, and then we'll preview Michigan and head out there to cover it. Until then, everybody, let's go racing. Uh,